All right. Now I'd like to welcome to the show my competitive enterprise institute colleague. Okay. The lighting okay? Everything itself? Yeah. No, he's just adjusting my side. Okay. <clears throat> now we're ready. Now I'd like to <clears throat> Now I'd like to welcome to the show my Competitive Enterprise Institute colleague, Darren Bax, Senior Fellow and Director of the Center for Energy and Environment. Welcome to Free the Economy, Darren. That's great to be here. Thanks, Richard. Now, in previous episodes, we've talked about the need to reform the way we build things in this country, in particular, when and under what conditions the government will allow you to build new infrastructure, industrial facilities, energy, and power plants, and things like that. We've gotten into the issue with guests like Alex Trembath of the Breakthrough Institute back in episode 15, for example. And this is why I was excited, Darren, to see your most recent study come out, and uh, that title being Four Principles for Real Permitting Reform, Why Congress Needs to Adopt Broad-Based Reforms. Now, before we get into those four steps, how did we get into the situation where this was such a problem in the first place? And how did it become so difficult to build necessary infrastructure in this country? Yeah, that's kind of the big question. In, in 1969, Congress passed a law called NEPA, and I think it got signed into law in 1970. But the idea was that you're simply going to review the environmental considerations of particular federal-related projects. But instead of it just being kind of a, be consider the, the environmental impact, it's become this kind of, monster of a law that requires detailed reports considering almost every alternative possible um, and it has just extended the the time to develop projects it creates disincentives to do projects in the first place but it's not just NEPA you know when NEPA was passed there were not these kind of landmark environmental statutes that we know of now like the Clean Water Act the Clean Air Act or the Major Species Act going down the list so in many ways, I wonder whether or not if NEPA passed after, like, I don't know that NEPA ever would have passed if those existing environmental sessions that existed beforehand, but it does. And it's also all these other environmental laws that have permitting requirements that we also need to bear in mind. So it's not just NEPA that creates all this burden. It's all, you have to get a permit when you want to build a house potentially under the Clean Water Act or farmers are worried about violating the Clean Water Act because they might you know, accidentally engage in improper dirt moving activities. I mean, it's, it's absurd. So there's all kinds of permitting concerns, not just for the big projects, but also the small property owner. Yeah, so we say uh, NEPA, this, you know, Washington DC is really a world of acronyms that we, you know, we, we use a lot. So that's the National Environmental Policy Act, which is one of right. the big, you know, signed by uh, President Nixon big environmental laws. And so, like you like you said, NEPA is originally supposed to guide the government's own decisions about the things that the government is is doing. Um, but of course, because a lot of people need under under different laws and under different uh, for different reasons, they need a permit from the government to do something in the first place. So when the government is deciding whether or not to give you a permit to do your project, then NEPA kicks in and says, Oh well, the government itself needs to look at what it's doing to see whether it'll have any negative environmental impacts. Um, but it's not just government programs; it's it's government letting you do your own thing that ends up falling under these requirements. Yeah, the, per the permitting becomes the the trigger for the for a NEPA review. So if, when you have all these laws that have all these permitting requirements, that means you're gonna have more NEPA reviews. And that's why it's so important to when we think about NEPA reform, that we're also thinking about reforming all these other laws. Because what's happening is the interpretation of the permitting requirements, these other laws, it's become so broad and, and, and the need to get permanent, uh, permit some of these laws. So it's constantly, you're constantly needing to permit from almost anything you can imagine. And there are oftentimes things you would never would imagine which is a big problem. These people, you have these innocent property owners getting, getting into trouble because they didn't get a permit. And, and as a result, 
you wind up having the permitting burden of these underlying environmental statutes, like the Clean Water Act, and then that can trigger the, the NEPA requirements as well. And one other thing about this, when we look back to the, the origins of this process, some people might say, well, why, why is this such a problem now? We've had this law for over 50 years. Um, one of the problems is that the incentives at issue here have made it worse over time. So if you, uh, you know, a, a National Environmental Policy Act review, if you, you know, you do a report and the report says, you know, here's a project, are there going to be any negative environmental consequences because of it? Uh, in the early 70s, that report might have been 25 pages long. <laughs> but now reports for big projects are like the size of a dictionary or an encyclopedia. They're like 3,000 pages long. Um, and so the, pro the problem is not just that there are are issues with this law, but that is the implementation of it has gotten dramatically worse and more costly over time. Yeah, and it's, it's more than just simply paperwork. It's about the litigation connected to the law. So like if you you feel like you've done things right, it just feels like there's endless litigation. And then once you address some other issue, there's some other, you're in court for something else. And it's just like, it's a never ending process. And, and now there's just a concern that we're, part of NEPA, one of the interpretations is that we're not simply looking at the impact of a particular project, but how the project has a kind of a cumulative effect um, and how it relates to past projects, future projects. And, and then you're looking at the concerns like that affects climate change and things are very speculative and indirect. And it's just like you're thinking about things that it's one thing to look at the environmental impact of this project. Will it have an impact on this water? What can we do? And, but it, it, it's far more than that. And that, that's the problem. I guess the point where it's, it becomes a futile exercise, exercise for, for developers or for any property owner. Um, and I think one of the big issues of the paper is that I think that there's a lot of focus on the, the 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 trees when I look at the forest the bigger pictures a lot of people involved in permitting reform focus on just such narrow issues and they get so in the weeds on the narrow issues we never take a step back to look at the bigger picture and what we're trying to achieve and that's why I wanted to do a principles paper so I wanted to look at those bigger issues all right well let's let's get into those so uh, principle number one permitting reform should actually go beyond NEPA reform. So like we said, the big, the, the, the single biggest cause of a lot of these problems when it comes to not being able to build stuff that we need uh, is the National Environmental Policy Act and all of the like uh, paperwork and litigation and, and costs that go along with it. Uh, but in order to do uh, a good reform that allowing permits to go forward, we should do more than just that. Yeah, I mean, I'll give an example of, um, you, you know, the, there's the recent Sackett case, the Supreme Court case, where the Sacketts are some property owners in Idaho that wanted to build a house on their, their land. And the, the way the, e, the Environmental Protection Agency and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers implement the the Clean Water Act, it's just they've taken this very broad interpretation of what waters are regulated under the Clean Water Act. And they just like, take such an expansive view that it makes, an, it makes it very difficult for property owners to even know what's regulated. And, and it's almost like you can, anything you can imagine when it comes to the water can be regulated. And, and that's what happened was there was a claim by the government that the Sackett's property was a wetland that should be regulated under and require a permit. And after lit years of litigation, the, Supreme, the Sackett's went to the Supreme Court once, they went to it recently a second time. Um, and finally, the Supreme Court uh, addressed the broad scope of the, the permitting requirements under the Clean Water Act, at least that particular, the four, it was called the Section 404 permitting in particular. And, but the, the Clean Water Act is just a great example because it has led to 
to product owners, and again, not just big developers, but small, really the just like a family, not being able to use their property the way they should be able to use their property. Because the, the government, the federal government has decided to take the most expansive view possible and probably enough, well, clearly an unauthorized interpretation of what waters are regulated. And then, but so you could go through all these different federal statutes to see similar issues. So there's a lot of focus on NEPA, but it's really important to not forget these other laws that are the that require the permits. And by requiring the permits, again, we as we brought up before, the requiring the permitting triggers the need for review. Well, yeah, I know under uh, what we sometimes call WOTUS, the Waters of the United States, WOTUS, WOTUS, uh, the federal, you know, federal rules about what you can do when you interact with like, uh, you know, bodies of water. Like, there's a big, beautiful lake, or there's the Mississippi River, or, or things like that. It's like, well, no, you can't dump, you know, dump a duck, tr uh, put a dump truck load full of industrial poison in the Mississippi River, that's not allowed. Um, but the, like you said, this uh, broadening of definition, which is even places that a normal person wouldn't think of as a body of water, just like a field, which is sometimes kind of wet, occasionally in certain times of the year, right? you have, you know, federal regulators who said, oh, no, that counts too. We get to regulate that too. And so instead of, well, what are the joke, you know, going back here is people said, well, this isn't really the waters of the United States. This is the moistures of the United States, right? Any any piece of land that's even occasionally wet, now all of a sudden they claim that they can like have complete control over. Yeah, and sadly, that's not really a, even a joke at this point, um, or it wasn't. It, we, I think one point that's worth mentioning, and this is just in the statute itself, that is that, I think people, when they think of the Clean Water Act and pollution into the waters and stuff, it, it's not about, oftentimes it has nothing to do with dumping some toxic waste into a pristine water. It's it, there, under what's referred to as Section 4 of force, which are dredge and fill permits. It literally is dirt moving activities. So if you, in theory, if you kick sand into a water, that could be pollution under the, the law. It's not meant to be, I mean, close to the law. But in the in the Saki case, for example, it's like here's a, a lake, and this connects to this little uh, ton, uh, sewer system, and that connects to this, and that connects to this other thing. Oh, and the second lot gets wet, you know, a few times a year. Therefore, those are wetlands um, that are therefore regulated because they're somehow adjacent to that lake that's way over there. And that's exactly what was going on: is that the the government plays this kind of game to try to connect all these little dots to cover the waters. And hopefully the Supreme Court in the new Sackett opinion helped to try to address that problem and narrow that the, the issue of narrow what it means for something to be a water around the States. Excellent. So we have principle two now. Permitting reform should apply across the board. What does that mean? Yeah, I think that this is probably main respect, maybe number one. Uh, yeah, sure. That's number one. Too often, permitting form is just simply let's do permitting for a specific special interest or a specific industry or a specific type of energy within uh, the the industry. And you know, the elephant in the room here is certainly permitting reform just for renewable energy. There are plenty of legislators out there that would like to do that. See, I released a recent report. Um, looking at other countries, uh, their permitting policies, and a lot of the permitting reforms, almost all of them, the, the nice little permitting reforms deal with renewable energy. They don't deal with other energy projects or other major projects at all. So the, the, the point is, if we're going to have permitting reform, we need to recognize these obstacles exist across the board, across industries, across sectors within an industry, and we just not pick winners and losers. We need to make sure that these obstacles and that to all these projects, and even for the small property owner, are addressed. So that that's the key point of it. And I think that's something that legislators need to bear in mind. Right. And so beyond the general principle of neutrality, which is like you said, not you're not picking winners and losers, not saying you only get an easier permit process if you have a windmill and not if you have a natural gas pipeline. Uh, but 
creating more carves out carve outs and exceptions to an already complicated system create makes the entire system overall even more complicated to navigate because then you have to figure out first you have to figure out whether you're eligible for a carve out exception to begin with or whether you need to go through the same you know the, the torturous long normal process um and so that's that's always the problem with these almost anywhere in regulatory policy we have these like a complicated set of government regulations and someone says oh well these are too burdensome we need to like make it easier but we need to make it easier just for my little subset you know that i like my industry or my technology but if you don't reform the underlying big picture process the whole thing becomes more complicated and expensive and difficult and so you you're not that's not really reform that's just sort of like favoritism for one subset of players. Yeah, there's a lot there. That's, first, that's a great point. And, and also, we see this in a lot of different areas where you you get a reform, but it's just fairly narrow and doesn't apply generally. But then there might be some type of mechanism in place to, well, first of all, people then will go to Congress to try to get them with that particular exception. Or they, they may delegate that power to an agency to decide who might also be eligible for the these little permitting exceptions make it easier for them. And then what's that lead to? It leads to cronyism, potentially even corruption, but honestly. And it, it sets up a really bad down, uh, system. And you can see how it can just be, people want to worry about all the lobbying and the special interests. That's what happens is the government breaks the system that kind of forces industry in some ways. They have to kind of go begging to try to get the exception that should be just applied across the board in the first place. And the one other question, it kind of relates to another issue that we're going to, that's what we're going to get to, but I'm going to uh, get ahead of you, sorry. Um, and, and that is, why is Congress or and, and the administration, or why are they in a position to even be able to figure out what's more important in terms of like an industry versus another, is is a renewable energy project really more important than critical water infrastructure to make sure that people have clean, drinkable water? I mean, what why drawing that distinction in the first place makes no sense. Yeah, so we've principle three about uh, Congress defining major projects. Yeah, it this is a separation of powers issue. It's there's language in existing statutes that have language like uh, in the national interest, like a project being in the national interest, or there's Senator Manchin's language, he's got a bill of permitting and he's used language like in it. Uh, he's giving like the president the ability to identify projects that are um, like 25 like major projects or whatever type of language, or there's in the national interest language as well in this bill. And, it, and so it's delegating to the president, it's delegating to specific agencies to make those choices as what's in the national interest. And it's like, those are not decisions that the executive branch be making. Those are decisions that if anybody's been making in terms of, but in, in terms of providing some type of benefit because something is just more important somehow, mm -hmm. And I'm saying, and by the way, when I talk about this, I still would apply the principle of don't pick winners and losers in terms of right. industries and sectors. But let's say there's some huge project and, and, you're, and you, there's a bunch of projects across sectors. Congress should be making those decisions. And if Congress is not going to actually make that decision about a specific project, they need to state in statute very specific language so that the, an agency implementing the law is not really having any discretion in determining what's in the national interest. What they're doing is they're just reviewing very objective criteria. And then ideally what should happen is even if they do that, Congress would then kind of have a, a say after the fact to then kind of approve, approve it almost like a RAINS Act, a concept where the, I don't want to be using acronyms, but the idea would be that okay, the agency has identified this as being a major project, but Congress will have another chance to decide by passing legislation whether or not they in fact agree with the agency decision. 
Right. Yeah. So the 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 Rains Act is something our our, our colleague uh, Wayne Cruz has written a lot about, and our, uh, right. our colleague Ryan Young, um, which would uh, allow Congress to vote on uh, executive branch regulations to authorize them or not. Um, so, I mean, this is like you said, the sort of the the real underlying principle should be that you know the government shouldn't be picking and choosing in the first place, but having Congress make the decision rather than some you know assistant secretary of commerce is probably the, <laughs> the better uh, the better way forward. Um, but I, I mean, this is a point I've I've made before. Uh, but if you so you find this in like zoning and permitting uh, rules at like the state and local level, as well as like the big you know federal level, like with this, where we have a, a system, but the the system is so dysfunctional, we have to build a secondary kind of emergency steam valve system on top of it, so that the underlying system doesn't strangle the handful of absolutely most important things, right? So you know we we know that the the normal system that is dysfunctional is going to like create all sorts of problems so we have to create the like get out of disaster free card by creating this other secondary process where like okay but if it's really important then it doesn't have to go through all this rigmarole and it has to and we can actually like let it happen um i think if you have to start making secondary and tertiary exceptions to the exceptions that kind of means that the rules you started off with aren't good to begin with that's absolutely right. But it's a great point. And it kind of reminds me of um, during the pandemic when you we, we kind of started waiving all these regulatory burdens because it's just like, isn't that kind of an example of why those regulations probably didn't be used in the first place? Um, and, and you're absolutely right. It's it's it, it basically is you've created a system that's so bad that okay, actually we really need to get something done. So let's pass some special little exemptions so we can actually do things. We know that the normal thing is we can't get anything done, but since you know, we've got the political will now for this little narrow slice of these special interests, we'll, we'll create a little exception for them. And that's what it could become. Again, you can just see all industries, the industries trying to get favor to try to get out of this horrible system that we have. And then I would just think about the term permitting and it is literally the government permitting, allowing you to use your property the way you would like to use the property. And that is disconcerting. This is a, certainly obviously a private property rights issue and it's a critical property rights issue. And because some of these projects that are being considered um, do have actually a huge impact on the, with the public, it limits our ability to develop these big projects, transportation, uh, water, some critical infrastructure that that's needed for this country. Well, yeah, it seems like it sometimes. Well, in general, in you know, when it comes to like thinking about whether some new government regulation is going to be a good idea or not a good idea, uh, we we generally think most of them are, are not good ideas. But uh, when it comes to people uh, in general assessing that, you know, often government agencies are expected to do what they call cost benefit analysis right any new regulation is going to have some costs of course and then the question is whether well is it going to produce some other benefits that wouldn't otherwise exist that you know produce a net uh, positive um for you know society for the country um in in some of these cases i feel like we are only looking at at the costs and and not the benefits, right? So if you if you want to build something that's going to cause you to you got to do some excavation, you got to move some dirt around, and someone says, well, some of that that dirt might cause some erosion, and then maybe you'll get some like cloudy water, and then maybe that will cause some other thing, and some fish won't will be unhappy about it, uh, and then and then that that's a reason to say no 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 you can't do it. But what what about the value of the project itself? Right. What about the energy it's going to produce? What about the cement it's going to produce? What about the people that are going to live there? What about the the roads that people are going to drive on and their life is going to be faster and efficient and better? Like we we seem to only be looking at the like marginal environmental impacts and not the idea. Right. Because none of these projects would happen in the first place unless they were going to provide a lot of benefit because people wouldn't pay for them. They wouldn't get financed. Right. Obviously, there's a huge net benefit waiting on the other side of these big projects not just the the small like you know family farm ones um and it it, it seems like a lot of policymakers are like almost ignoring the what should be the obvious benefits to a lot of these projects because of you know of some upset fish upstream 
Yeah, and uh, look, it's perfectly reasonable to consider these environmental impacts, but there's a bigger issue, even beyond permitting, that I've heard about and discussed, and, and that is there is no recognition of the trade-offs, um, and that everything is all about the environmental issue, and you're kind of getting to this, but if you don't move forward with a project or then you know, what other, what benefits are you um, kind of not going to be able to secure for society and build the economy or whatever? But more than that, what rights are you um, infringing upon in, in the process? And the, the, the thing is, if, if let's say you block an energy project and you think, oh, that's good for the environment, and, but the, there, there are costs to that. It's not just the benefits, the costs are, as a result, we're going, you're going to wind up driving up energy prices. You're going to make it more expensive for consumers. You're going to have disproportionate impact on lower income households as a result. So it's not just not looking at the benefits that you're foregoing. Mm -hmm. You're also looking at the, I guess, the, the cost as a result of it. Because everything is filtered in through this kind of environmental and oftentimes climate, increasingly climate um, focus. And, and this may go beyond what we're probably talking about, but I think just do think it's part of a bigger theme. We see this in the Biden administration's whole of government approach where bringing in the climate issues, environmental issues, and trying to integrate it across agencies. So you'll see an agency like the USDA, the Department of Agriculture, where you, you start to look at the mission statement on their website. It's like, it's no longer about producing, you know, a, being productive in the production of food and efficient in producing food and safe food. It's like at the lead, it's like we're going to focus more on doing producing food in an environmentally friendly way. And, what I, and, and that becomes the priority as opposed to the, that's not what the mission of the USDA is and what we should be doing. And, and, and just for farmers, the, their goal is number one, should be efficiently producing food and and doing, we want to have low cost food so we don't, people are not spending too much. We want, we want people to have choices for food. And then I would say down and down in that list is, hey, consider about the environmental impacts of it as well. But instead, the, the main issues are kind of like some industries in farming is an example, by the way. So we could go to any other industry. The, the number one issue is environmental stuff. And the secondary, and, and, and the primary issues have become the secondary issues. So this is a huge issue, and it's it's a maybe it's a philosophical thing for folks, but um, I think it's kind of a common sense thing that when we produce food, low cost, uh, safe, efficient food production, that's more important than some of these other issues. Right, exactly, because the the best way to have zero climate impact is to just not do anything ever at all. Right. People are like, well, we want to get fertilizer runoff lower because we don't want fertilizer runoff in waterways. Uh, but the best way to do that would be to use zero fertilizer. Right. And then you've achieved your environmental uh, objective. But people would starve to death because there wouldn't be enough food. So obviously we can't have that be the primary goal because that wouldn't make any sense. What, what is ironically is part of the government programs are literally we're going to pay you not to farm some land. Right. Uh, so there, so, so there's actual genuine aspect to that at that point. Well, yeah, in a wealthy country like the United States, we can pay farmers not to farm. But if you were going to try and put this this hierarchy onto, say, like the developing world, and then say, well, they have to worry about environment first and then affordable food second, then people really would start to death. And and, and unfortunately, one of my big concerns is that's exactly what, especially the EU, is trying to kind of push is, and the U.S. is starting to kind of, well, the Biden administration is starting to, to adopt this kind of U.N. type of model of imposing those types of environmental first policies on things like basic needs, like food production. And it's like, what about the fact that you're, yeah, these people are <laughs> starved? Isn't that the kind of consideration? Um, we see this obviously in climate policy as well. Well, don't they need to actually be able to produce energy? Um, so they can actually get out of poverty. Uh, issues like just being able to have clean water for a lot of people is 
is an actual issue. They have to drink new water that you don't have to worry about dying from. Uh, but instead, you think that they're you. We want to impose our will on these other countries, and we're just being hypocrites because we've already achieved through actual reliable energy sources what they want to achieve. But we're going to tell them, no, you need to act like we're acting and sacrifice their the the, the prosperity that we've achieved. Um, so yes, that's a big problem as well. All right. Well, let's get back to the final principle uh, as we as we start to wrap up. Uh, so permitting reform, this is a more specific kind of recent one. Permitting reform should eliminate or significantly reduce the scope of IRA energy subsidies. What are those? Yeah. I, well, so the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which I'm not still in name for an act and the law, um, had about $369 billion worth of green energy type of subsidies in the, in the law is basically a law designed to radically change the way we produce electricity, the way we, what kind of cars we drive is basically a government top-down approach to restricting uh, the ability of Americans to basically make the types of choices they want and also to have reliable and affordable electricity. It, a lot of it is about renewable energy and pushing renewable energy and electrifying the grid through um, renewable energy, which is unreliable uh, electricity and will drive up costs and create all kinds of problems for the grid itself. So, so you've got that and, and the estimates are, the chances are the, the depending on how the how it plays out, the cost could go way beyond 369. But it could be over a trillion by some estimates. But the one of the obstacles that the people that are pushing these policies are finding is that they can't get the projects done because of the permitting system. Mm -hmm. So they would like to reform the permitting system to be able to untap those resources. And this gets into the thinking winners and losers problem again. So they probably just want to do it for them, for the renewable energy. So there's kind of an interesting dynamic. Like we want permitting reform. I would want permitting reform. But we, on the other hand, we don't want, we certainly don't want it just for one renewable energy. But even if it's broader, you do have that threat of helping, uh, inadvertently, helping to untap those Inflation Reduction Act subsidies and putting more unreliable electricity on the grid. So you've got this kind of weird dynamic where, well, that's not good. So the argument and the principle is legislators, you can't ignore that tension and that reality. There, the government has already picked huge winners right now. That's called renewable energy and the Replacement Reduction Act. We need to be cognizant of that in the permanent reform. So I think that any permanent reform package going forward needs to be aggressively going after the, the IRA subsidies to the greatest extent possible. I'm not saying there's not going to be any energy subsidies and therefore you shouldn't have, like you don't have permitting reform unless you get rid of every, every energy subsidy. That's not going to happen. I know that. Right. But it needs to be a priority. It needs to be up there for legislators to be pushing back and to have some tangible reforms to ensure that at, at least, if nothing else, they're minimizing the damage being caused by the IRA. And yeah, I think that's just really important. So you're not implicit, implicit is a lot of work. You're, you're not part of, it's, it's acerbating the problem that these subsidies will, will um, lead to. All right, Before so before we go, can you give us a little political handicapping in how so these are four principles for you know potential. These could be in maybe more than one bill. They could be in one big piece of legislation that is a you know a permit reform uh, bill potentially. Uh, what's going to get this across the finish line, right? Because we got we got a lot of like variables here. We've got you know Joe Manchin. He's Democrat, but sometimes he votes with the Republicans, and he's been vocal about wanting permitting reform. But you know, uh, not everyone loves his bill. You know, we've got the Republicans are controlling the House, but the Democrats are, you know, in, you know, in effect with thin control of the Senate. How is how are we going to how are we going to get this through? 
Yeah, I mean, I think the idea for the principles is just to kind of reform the thinking further across the board on the permitting bills. So hopefully, if there's a piece of legislation that is actually just favoring renewable energy, you know, to me, a win would be legislators saying, we're not going to support that bill because that violates its principle of picking winners and losers. To me, that is success. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, though, we want permitting reform that is across the board. I think it's going to be extremely difficult, this Congress. They did pass some permitting reforms in the Fiscal Responsibility Act, the debt ceiling package. I think it's going to make it less likely that something will get done. And even if they had it, it's going to be very difficult to get something meaningful passed in the first place. I mean, it's difficult to get anything passed, really meaningful, but it's actually good um, in this Congress. So I, I don't think it's great chances of some really great permitting reform package, but I think if nothing else, these principles hopefully will ensure that nothing bad gets uh, passed. And, and also, it, hopefully, legislators will be thinking about the Inflation Reduction Act as they are thinking about permanent reform as well, because that's critical. Um, we, the IRA is a real threat uh, to uh, the way we get electricity, to I think, um, prosperity in this country. I think it needs to be way up there for legislators concerned with energy and environmental issues and actually just economic well being in this country. And so as they do talk about program reform, if they can keep IRA in mind, that will be a huge win. Yeah, that's I think that's a really good point about any any of us uh who have been in in this in this world for a while trying to trying to write about you know good public policy and recommending reforms. We're not we're not necessarily here to save or to uh, to solve every problem in the world, but we are proudly here to try and make it less bad. <laughs> that does that, that is true, and um, and I think that that said, yeah, in some ways this paper is to kind of make that's part of it. The principles paper is a way of thinking through. You know, it's intentionally designed to be more of a take a step back, think about and apply these principles so that you don't do something that's bad or you do something that's right. And then you're like, wait a second, this actually meets the, these important principles. So this is a good piece of legislation. I think it's really important, though, for us to be very specific and go out and be very proactive and identify very specific legislative solutions. And, th and that will be a different paper for another time. But for this paper, it's, that's not the time. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, Darren, uh, tell people where they can find you and all your stuff online. Where should they go? Where should they go? Because obviously they're going to want more Darren at this point. Uh, well, I hope so. Um, well, go to this bit of Enterprise Institute website, cdi.org, cdi.org, and you can find all our stuff. It's easy to find. So yeah, please visit uh, the CI website. And I'm on Twitter at at Darren Bax. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, do that. So. All right. Thank you so much, Darren. And uh, this has been a great, important topic. And then, you know, as soon as Congress passes a major piece of legislation that includes all of your four principles, we'll bring <laughs> you back on and then you can like take credit for it. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that's going to happen soon. So I'll <laughs> see you soon, I guess. Okay. Thanks. Yeah.